Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 339th New Social Environment. I'm Ty Cooper, a production assistant here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation on Nam June Paik with Rudolf Freeling and Constance Llewellyn. We're thrilled to have the artist and musician Clara Joy here who will perform to close today's program. We've started all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wabinger, Kanarsi, Mansi, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom in recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories do not, our, our histories never unfold in isolation, as said by Angela Davis. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check the chat in just a moment for a living document of resources and action, uh, actions. And now to, to introduce today's guest and host, curator of media arts at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Rudolf Freeling is the co-curator of the recent retrospectives, Nam June Paik, Suzanne Lacey, We Are Here, Bruce Connor, It's All True, and the survey soundtracks. Freeling is also a senior adjunct professor at the California College of the Arts in San Francisco. He holds an MA from the Free University of Berlin and a PhD from the University of Hildesheim. Curator and writer Constance Llewellyn is adjunct curator at the University of California Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, where she has curated many contemporary art exhibitions, including Ant Farm, 2004, co-curated with Steve Sade, A Rose Has No Teeth, Bruce Nauman in the 1960s, and most re recently co-curated Stephen Kaltenbach, The Beginning and the End for the Minetti Shrem Museum at UC Davis. She is the author of 500 Cap Street, David Ireland's House, and co-author with Dor Bowen of Bruce Nauman's Facial Encounters, both published by UC Press. She is an editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. Connie, take it away. Okay. Waiting for that first slide. <laughs> Here we go. Um, well, as you can see, this is the way one enters the exhibition at SF MoMA. And the first thing you see is Nam June Paik's first film in which very, he very simply covers his face with his hand in this very simple gesture. Um, tell us a little bit about how this show came about, Rudolf. Hi, Connie. First of all, um, thanks to you and thanks to the whole team at Brooklyn Rail for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. Um, well, you know, um, as you guys said earlier, it takes a village to do this. Um, it took a village to, um, to pull off um, the first um, major retrospective of his work, of Nam June's work after his passing, 2006. And, uh, and it, you know, it, al it also takes years of preparation and it takes the right moment to ask for it. And for us, the right moment came when we had literally worked for years on a major acquisition with the Namjoon Peak estate because we literally did only have one installation by Namjoon when I arrived here at the museum and I was really intent on changing that over time. So um, in like 2013, 14, we had this opportunity and acquired a major amount of works ranging from his earliest to his last, among his last works uh, in all media, uh, co-acquired with the um, uh, painting and sculpture department here in Tranley. And, um, and the Tate, um, Tate Modern was actually doing something quite similar with the estate. So we were actually partners in this and it, was almost a natural ask for them to say, well, why don't we do a retrospective of his work? And um, we, were, uh, we were very, very glad to immediately join them. And um, them is mostly my colleague and co-curator, Su Kyung Lee, who's senior curator at Tate Modern. And, um, and it, so it became a co-organization and a co-curation of, um, of this show that also found a tremendous interest internationally. Uh, we finally managed to um, make this a four venue international tour starting in London in the fall of 2019, then Stead Lake Amsterdam. And uh, you know it was meant to open on the day the country closed uh, last year in March, um, close to the pandemic. 
and um, so I actually never went. Um, I had I was wise enough to not even travel to uh, to Europe or to Holland in March, and um, um, and it ultimately became um, SF MoMA became the only U.S. venue, um, although we had interest um, both in Chicago as well as in other places in the U.S. and also internationally, but. We really wanted this show to travel to places where Nam June's work had not been seen so widely. And believe it or not, um, this is the first major survey or retrospective, certainly um, on the West Coast ever, which I, you know, found hard to believe. But so there were all all good reasons for us to join the Tate, and uh, we were really excited by the fact that um, an Asian venue is um, the final stop, the National Gallery in Singapore, uh, starting in December. You can go to the next next image. Um, I'm just going to mention that this this work on paper uh, we're showing it here as the first image, but in the show, it, it appears at the end. But tell us, Rudolph, why you think this is an important piece to have here at this moment? Well, um, you know, it's when we, when we were discussing images or the selection of images, um, it occurred to me that this one is kind of like a perfect introduction to who Nam June was. And, uh, and I say that not only because you actually see him in the picture, um, with his dad. Um, he was born in 1932 and he was born on July 20th. And he made this kind of humorous collage of, um, of references. And you see basically a, um, yes, a biographical reference um, to his family. You see uh, a reference to Jackie Onassis, Jackie Kennedy, who was born on the same day. He loved that. Um, he also loved that uh, July 20th saw the first landing on the moon in 1969. And maybe more interestingly even, um, he associated his birthday uh, with the same day um, attack on Hitler by the German officer von Stauffenberg in 1944. Um, and then he made that sort of a mathematical equation in a humorous way. and. Um, and I like this picture because it does, um, it does sort of show you the range of references that were always um, at play for Nam June. Um, you see his humor, uh, his eclectic uh, set of references and layers in his work. And, um, and for us, this is kind of the end of a, um, of a show that really sees a lot of his um, work in, in mixing images and mixing references. Um, and, and that kind of just captures that. So um, July 20th is coming up, do something in homage to Nam June on that day. I think he would love that. <laughs> okay. Well, this is um, a, a sort of a chart of a show that was called Symphony in 20 Rooms. And again, it's the idea of mixing. Um, uh, this was, well, you can describe it, but it was a group of sonic events that go from one room to the other. It's a transition from performing music, as he says, to showing music. Yes, yes. And uh, this, was a, this is a really important piece for me in that it kind of highlights what we were trying to do with this retrospective. Of course, you always, have an almost impossible task to to show all of all of the important works by an artist to cover his entire career and um, uh, and to do that without the artist so first of all um, to work closely with the estate was really important for us um, to get first-hand accounts of his former assistant john hoffman was important and um, and then to also chart some new territory and and try something a little bit differently and uh, and for me that was the idea that that we could maybe really focus much more on on a few aspects of Nam June's career specifically the idea that um, he liked to collaborate he liked to perform he liked to reference music because he was coming out of music as a scholar of music and philosophy and um, and this idea that 
yes, you would, you would look at music through an engagement with space. And Symphony for 20 Rooms, if you do a quick math, is actually not 20, it's 16 rooms. Um, it was never realized, but it acts as a kind of marker of, of his program, if you wish, almost his algorithm. Um, you see all the elements already at work in 1961. And um, what we exhibited very large um, on the landing of, uh, you know, at the entrance of our show is a translation into English of the original German score from 1961, which he thought he had lost, but then we found again. And um, so that idea that you, you stop performing music, but you expose music, you expose music in space, and you relate to the audience in a very new and novel way, specifically through his notion of audience participation that was then um, executed, if you will, um, throughout his entire career. So for me, this is kind of a programmatic statement and um, it was only, to my knowledge, it was only ever performed once in Denmark a few years ago as a sort of short-lived uh, event. Um, but I, it, it acted for me as a kind of um, programmatic statement that um, you should you should walk through the show um, with this in mind, with the idea that things constantly blur into each other, that you run into other people, um, that it is a notion of music that is maybe not the um, the kind of music that you know, but it's a different sort of listening that is required here. I would move on. Of course, this is maybe the iconic work by Pate that, that people will know, the TV Buddha, which is just sort of this so elegantly and simply sheds light on the East-West dialogue that permeates his work. And um, as you said, Rudolph, that what this show at this venue does is really highlight performance collaboration and East-West dialogue. Um, so obviously he was very much interested in Zen Buddhism and it, it shows throughout his career, but at the same time, he really wasn't a Buddhist. And it's notable that he was introduced to Zen Buddhism, not, not through his, his own heritage, but through John Cage. John Cage actually was a Buddhist, but um, in any case, um, this is really such a terrific piece to start the show and it really does begin the show. Uh, of course, you know, it's it's a retrospective and this is the first of his iconic series of Buddhas and um, it is one of um, one of many pieces that um, engage real time that engage a closed circuit installation and uh, and of course people, you know, have this uh, instant urge to verify that it's a live image. Um, I was um, I was really struck by um, by the details of the Buddha, you know, actually, it's it's so easy to just focus on the um, on the representation of the the Buddha on TV, uh, which of course is you know so so seventies so much of its time, and uh, but still working. Um, thankfully, um, it has a vibrancy to the still image that is obviously not captured here in the still. But also the um, the Buddha has has details that are quite stunning and um, and show off a lot more emotion than you would imagine in this minimalist work. So we wanted to just start with an iconic introduction, but also to highlight the idea of reduction of minimalism and the inspiration of Buddhism, like you you know uh, you pointed rightfully to Cage here. But um, he also said, you know, I'm, I'm interested in Buddhism just like I'm interested in Johann Sebastian Bach. So he's interested in many things. Um, and, uh, and obviously um, the, um, the small, beautiful drawing on the left, um, and there are many like those, um, is this idea of, uh, of citing the Buddha inside television, uh, of finding, um, 
maybe abstraction, but also the gesture of the hand and um, and the the spirit, if you will, uh, within TV. And and you see the TV is um, is just a quick, you know, a quick uh, rough sketch, um, almost like um, an emoji today. Um, and he did that throughout his life. So this this practice of drawing. Um, we're not focusing on that here in this talk, but it's very visible and, uh, and sort of a, a permanent parallel practice to his really important work in, um, in electronics. So um, we have a wonderful, we pair this with a beautiful um, candle TV and, uh, and, and a large installation from our collection called Egg Rose. And we just wanted to, to really highlight the idea that he did, he engaged with minimalism and abstraction and the live and the real time throughout his entire career. So the candle TV um, that we show is actually one of his last words from 2004. And, um, and that is, um, I think, a beautiful um, sort of quieter way of introducing his work that then becomes also quite engaging, um, quite uh, noisy in many ways, um, as we will see um, in our yeah. next image. In our next image, um, well, here we're encountering, uh, among other things, uh, one of his prepared piano. And of course, he derived that idea from John Cage, who, you know, would put bolts and screws and other small objects in between the strings to alter the sound of the instrument. Pike, or Pake, I'm so sorry. Pake um, reinterpreted, but in a much more um, flamboyant, I guess you could say, way where he would put, and you see there's a little video screen to the left of the piano, and then you actually see a prepared piano, not that one being performed. And he put all manner of, of objects in the piano, a tape recorder, uh, anything you can toys, photographs, video. So, um, and the, another difference between his peer prepared pianos and Cage's is that he invited, take invited audience participation, whereas Cage did not. Exactly, and um, and he um, he really went beyond Stockhausen as well. And, uh, and those two major composers in the early 60s or the late 50s, early 60s, Cage and Stockhausen were his really main points of references. Um, he worked with both of them and um, Cage obviously uh, became a lifelong friend um, and um, Peck collaborated with Stockhausen in 61 uh, on this multimedia theatrical happening called Originale which was then performed in New York in 64. Um, but what he did not invite was uh, Joseph Boyce at the opening of his uh, first ever show in 63 called Exposition of Music Electronic Television. And Boyce took an ax and uh, literally destroyed one of the four pianos and broke it to pieces. And he called that an homage to Pake's music and to pay his, his uh, sense of action music or a music as he called it. And um, it's a little bit hard to see on the, on the top right, you see a small quote, um, which is basically saying, um, why is it music? Well, um, why is it not not music? Not um, music. That, um, that and many other quotes uh, throughout the show uh, really show us the, um, the humor, but also the deep philosophical thinking in Peck, and um, and it is it is one of the pleasures really of actually reading Peck, his writings that were just published last year by MIT, and um, our dear friend and colleague John Hanhardt is one of the co-editors of that book. So um, <clears throat> the um, um, the the quote that uh, we saw. Um, did we actually see that? I'm not sure. The, the, the slide before um, next to the Buddha is as boring as possible, like Proust, Palestrina, Zen, Gregorian chant. Oh, we cut the quote. Anyway, I'm telling you this. <laughs> uh, Gregorian chant, Missa Parisian Cafe, life, sex, and dog staring into the distance. <laughs> And you know, it, it's this impossible list. Why would you think of, of this mix of, of references? 
and um, I was always wondering about the dog, and um, and it only occurred to me just the other day. Um, he might be thinking of his master's voice, you know, the record company yes. and, and the dog on that. So, um, anyway, um, what we do, what we also see obviously here is um, the, uh, some of the um, rem uh, remainders of, of this really radical 63 um, show. And uh, a lot of these works cannot travel anymore. Uh, some of these could only travel to the European venues and didn't make it across um, across to the state. And um, the uh, if we I think if we go to the next one, um, we see <clears throat> yeah we see one of these pianos, and you also see the um, the really Fluxus inspired um, treatment of prepared pianos, it wasn't so um, so clinical and so um, um, maybe joyful um, as Cage did. Um, it was much more violent. And, uh, you know, as you can see on the right, this is sort of voice action. Um, and Peck completely embraced that. Um, I wouldn't say he loved it probably, but <laughs> he, he did embrace it. And, um, and Boyce and, um, and Peck um, continued to do piano performances. Um, as we will see, yeah. Later on, as we will see, yes. Let's go to the next. So the irony, if you will, is um, that um, these are not participatory objects anymore. They've become museum objects with a few exceptions. And this is one, uh, Random Access, um, which was a, um, a site-specific piece in this gallery in Wuppertal, Germany in 63. And I hear there are still remnants in the basement where uh, you, know, you see on the left, um, that's the original from 63. Um, the Guggenheim acquired the rights to, do, um, to perform the work through an exhibition copy. And it's such a pleasure of actually installing the work. So you have four types of tape um, you get to choose and to randomly also place uh, strips of magnetic tape onto the wall to approximate a pattern that you see on the left and to possibly um, assume a, a kind of chaotic maze. Maybe you think of an urban grid of sorts, something organic uh, that you can still reach with your hand. And here you see a performer, um, a colleague performing this for our public. Um, I have to say the pandemic really um, made it extremely difficult to think of um, physical interaction with objects. And in this particular case, we decided that um, performers, if you will, um, colleagues would do this um, on a regular basis for the public. But uh, is, what, um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to ask if this is going to become participatory for the audience. Um, uh, well, yes. Um, crossing fingers, we're on a good way here. And um, I think the museum is ready to open it up again in September. Uh, for physical interactions and to kind of reduce all those safeguards against um, the fear, you know, the fear of touching and uh, and yeah. maybe uh, transmitting the virus. <clears throat> yeah. okay. It's an it's an important piece um, because you immediately see that um, the action of the uh, of the public, the human interaction, is obviously quite different from a technological setup. Uh, whereas the machine has the perfect speed, the human does not. Uh, what you hear is that's not a perfect representation of whatever is stored. Um, and whatever is stored is basically symbols, drums, um, sine waves, um, some silences and noise. Um, again, it is not the traditional kind of music you would expect. It's not like there is a slow down Mozart coming to you. Uh, but you do find pleasure in actually engaging with um, intersections of sounds um, that you come across randomly and, and you engage with that by going back and forth uh, with the head in your hand. Yeah. 
I mean, there are other, I think you pointed out, there were a couple of other pieces in the show which may become, become participatory in the fall. Right. right. Well, um, what I like about this early invite is the fact that, um, first of all, um, this was 63 and he was working uh, very, very secretly on his experiments in television. And it was such a secret that he wouldn't even call his show the way it was called later. Um, that is exposition of music dash electronic television. Here in this early invite, it was just exposition of music and electronic television is part of um, taglines, if you will. The taglines um, are also uh, also display his very typical mix of languages from German, yeah. English to French. And then of course, everything is printed on, uh, on a Korean daily paper. So clearly, um, th the mix of languages was part of his DNA, so to speak. You know, obviously he came from Korea. Uh, he emigrated with his family to Japan, uh, studied in Japan, then um, went to Germany for eight years from 56 to 64. Uh, and then of course moved on to the US as we all know and, uh, and went back and forth uh, yes. throughout his life. Yeah. <clears throat> So, um, and he spoke many all these languages, did he not? I mean, he could speak. He, many he did, although, <laughs> frankly speaking, um, he was at times hard to understand. Yeah, as we will uh, see. <laughs> but yeah, yeah he, he sort of also, I would say, he performed um, a poor Korean speaking poorly languages um, and downplaying a little bit um, what he was trying to accomplish. But um, he was a, uh, a master not only of the cultural and political and historical narratives in these languages or in these cultural domains, uh, both in the East and the West, um, but he also uh, was able to write um, very well, as you, as you know, if, if, you, if you looked at the book, you would see immediately. And um, so it was kind of a, a play that he played, um, a, a play of words, a play of references, and, and the idea that you could never ever grasp everything that is written down here. Obviously, very few of us uh, read or speak Korean. Um, not all of us speak all these three Western languages um, and so on. Yeah. Let's go to the yeah. next. And um, to underscore again the importance of text, um, you know, this was the 60s and with fluxes, this was clearly still um, the era of manifestos, of revolutionary avant-garde uh, gestures and manifestos and texts. And this one here is called Post Music, way before anybody talked about post-structuralism or, or post-modernism for that matter. Uh, and what is post music is obviously something that goes beyond music, but it still is music. And, and that's why I, I made this reference earlier, saying he loved the idea that something could be music because it was not not music. And, okay. and it, it really opened up the definition of what a genre might mean. And, um, and I think that was a really important um, push towards um, addressing the boundaries of almost every genre he worked in. And obviously, and most specifically television and, um, and the electronic image on video. Yeah, didn't he say, I go where um, empty roads are? Um, and also, I just want to point out that he, was, he destroyed instruments, as you said, over and over again, before Jimi Hendrix, that's all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He also said, I quote, don't correct my English. Oh, did he? <laughs> 60s is over. It's time to disrupt English grammar after having disrupted FCC TV lines. FCC <laughs> is the Federal Communication Commission. Right, all right. <laughs> That's good. Let's go to the next one. Of course, everybody is familiar with the fact, I think, that his, his most frequent and long-lasting collaborator was the cellist Charlotte Mormon, who was a classical cellist, but also very much involved in, in new music and, you know, was, was a great partner. And they did all of these iconic works like, like TV, um, excuse me, 
uh, like the TV bra and so forth. So there's a lot of space in the show, I think deservedly show, so on their collaborative works. And one of which is, is, why don't you describe the one that's actually reproduced with the oil drums? Um, well, first of all, we really decided early on that we would dedicate entire galleries to these specific uh, important collaborations. And Charlotte, um, while um, she's been rediscovered and re, uh, reappraised, so to speak, or you know, has, has really resurfaced as one of the major uh, women artists uh, and performers in the 60s and 70s, um, and uh, obviously was a longtime collaborator for Bake. Um, she's also produced one of the most important actions and uh, interventions with him. And one of the things that was um, really important for both Sue and me was to really show the agency that Charlotte had in this in this um, collaboration. She wasn't just performing Peck's pieces. Um, she was also making him do things like you see here on the right um, in their um, one of the first um, performances they did in 1965, where he becomes um, the body of the cello and she plays him, if you will, in a, yeah. in a sort of physical but also metaphorical way. Um, and then, of course, the TV cello, which is one of the most amazing pieces in the show, I think, um, is um, incredibly still working, <laughs> although it's only on four days a week. Uh, so do not come on a Monday if you if you <laughs> want to see the show. Um, but uh, but the idea that you you could enhance not just what um, what cello means, what an instrument, is, what a tool is within the fine arts. Um, you know, to to quote again, Nam June, don't ask what cello can do for me, but ask what I can do for cello, or you know, what I can do for Charlotte. And um, and it was the both of them were intent on. Um, almost sexualizing music. They felt that um, the music, the whole music industry, the whole music tradition was so stale and so retro. And um, I, you know, excuse me, we all love classical music, but whenever I go to a classical concert, I always find it is, it is just steeped in these old, old rituals. And so they were really breaking out of this and, um, and they, they got into trouble. Um, Charlotte was arrested in the 60s, um, performing half, half naked. And, um, and he, he felt, um, Nam Jun certainly took his, his responsibility very seriously here. And he supported uh, Charlotte as much as he could in the following years. Um, she did lose um, all her engagements as a classical cellist. Oh, you know, one of one of the consequences, unfortunately. Well, one of the most um, notorious is the TV bra for a living sculpture. And in the show, you actually see the apparatus she used to hold those two little TVs. Um, but also there's the oil drum. I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, oil drum installation where um, Pike is, play Pike is playing variations on a theme by Sansan and Mormon is playing the opening bars of the composition before going on a ladder, lowering herself into the top drum filled with water, and then descending the ladder and continuing playing. That must have been really great to see. So it's sort of simulated in the exhibition. Yes, yes. It's, um, it's one of the few real sculptures that um, Peck made um, that's now in the collection of the Lembrook Museum in, uh, in Germany. Um, and um, and it does um, it does refer it does literally show you that moment that was staged in New York on I don't know I think somewhere on Broadway or Forty Second Street or somewhere um, and um, and it is that moment that was that um, that exposed her her uh, partial nudity um, coming out of the uh, out of the water tanks um, but also. Um, this is not maybe not as obvious in this piece, but um, you know, oil drums. Um, this was um, this was part of the uh, you know, <laughs> Vietnam War had started. Um, 
Peck was later very, very conscious of the economics of, uh, of war, the capitalist society. Um, he was very um, ecologically minded, um, always intent on saving energy and, uh, and surfacing those as a topic. Um, so there are all these undercurrents and, um, and one of the most political pieces in, in the whole show is Guadalcanal Requiem, which he did with Charlotte um, some 10 years later as a video. Um, specifically critiquing um, the militarism and, um, and the Vietnam War yeah. um, through, um, through a performance of, with cello. Well, the next, next slide I think is um, another iconic early piece called Zen for TV, which consists of a 19 inch TV on its side and what you see is a static vertical line. <clears throat> which was created actually by an interrupted circuit in the cathode ray tube that had been damaged in shipping. So he embraced this sort of as Marcel Duchamp and John Cage mm -hmm. before him, the idea of embracing chance and malfunction. But, you know, we just saw the cello and the string of the cello, you know, this for me sort of still resonates with that, you know, although this precedes his work with Charlotte, um, obviously. But the idea that you can condense image, um, a real-time image, television image into this one line, yes, it was an accident, but it was programmatic in many ways. And what you do not necessarily see here is, or hear, um, is that originally there was still sound and um, the night of the opening in 63, in March 63 in Germany, um, there was a, um, an Akira, Akira Kurosawa feature film called Drunken Angel uh, broadcast on German television. And the gallery had, uh, the gallery's opening hours were synchronized with um, the broadcasting schedule uh, of German television. So it was, you, know, you could still project a kind of image out of this, but all you would see is a, a line and, um, and one of the things that is so beautiful in actually seeing these things live is that you see that this is never just a static image. It looks static, but it is always, there's always movement. There's a certain uh, almost repressed vibrancy in this. And, uh, and that becomes quite obvious um, um, a little bit later. But um, before we go there, it's also clear here that, um, you know, television sets fail, as we all know, and um, it is impossible to preserve one set for eternity. So from the very, very get-go, from the beginning, Peck was conscious of that uh, conundrum, and he basically made his major pieces almost conceptual works, and that he would always recreate them with a new set, a more current, a sort of up-to-date set. So I'm sure today he would work on gigantic flat screens and sort of um, disrupt whatever beautiful representation they might be able to offer. And also um, the two plate, yeah. Yeah, it's two and four, I think. Okay. <laughs> um, so here you see a, um, two versions of that, um, one from the 70s and one from the 80s. And, um, and we just accomplished, we, we got a version in the show from our collection, which is from 1990. Um, and we just did a, an exhibition copy of that. Um, Two court, right? Just as beautiful. Huh? Um, somebody's it's, sound it's, is not um, turned off here. <laughs> nice intervention though. <laughs> That's, but I think we should move along as Time yeah, we have. I think we have a, um, a video clip now of, uh, of Nam Jun, yeah. which is just listen to how he explains his work, yeah. this particular work. Yeah, well, what about anti television? Huh? Anyway, the, this is one line television, and it's like uh, people ask me why you make so exciting not boring videotapes. Uh, my answer is my first 60s, early 60s, I did intensely, you know, minimal art, uh, minimal aesthetics, you know, boring, you mm -hmm. know. 
before that word came up, you know, so I don't want to repeat my early days, you know. So I was rather be corrupted than repeating this <laughs> sublime age. But how do you get that? Uh, you know how I got always mistakes. Very often you have a, this stage of a TV set at home, you know, when mm. vertical yeah. thing break down, it becomes like that, and you call repairman, you know. Mm. And I brought actually this, I mean, this TV set to gallery, and it got broken, and only one this, on this shape, it was not interesting. I said, oh, I would not show. Then I said, oh, maybe I um, turn around here, like that. And then, then I put title Zen for TV, you know. So that's it, and it became the best piece. Thank you, boss. Grazie mille. Thank you. Um, you yeah, know, this, is, this seems a little bit random, but um, think about TikTok today and the idea that a uh, moving image has become increasingly vertical through our phones. Um, it's, um, it's quite stunning, actually. But, um, you know, one, one of the major narratives around Nam June's work is always um, him, the disruptor. And, and the inventor and the visionary of the electronic image and uh, certainly the father of video art. And um, while all of that is true, we really wanted to also show an important aspect of his work. Um, and that is about um, the, the generative uh, aspect of almost beauty, if you will. And, uh, and one of the best examples is this work from the Whitney's collection, uh, Magnet TV. Um, which is, um, to my mind at least, one of the most beautiful moments of a live image becoming an abstraction and yet also a three-dimensional ephemeral form, a, sc a sculpture, literally. And, um, and the, um, the effects, of course, um, generated by this um, intervention on, on hardware, you know, this really strong, strong magnet placed on top of the TV, um, that um, distorts and shapes uh, the image in real time is something that is variable. And, um, and I get like once a week, I get a message from, uh, from our gallery um, attendants and conservators where the image or the, the um, sorry, the magnet has been uh, moved and has been not displaced, but just moved. So um, the image is not centered anymore, for example. And, um, and the funny thing was when we installed the piece, um, the conservator from the Whitney um, who joined us remotely, um, that was in this particular case, quite simple and easy. Um, and we said, well, you know, we, we are aware of the fact that we need to move the magnet for conservation reasons, um, at least once a week. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, that's true, but actually don't you worry, somebody's gonna move this anyway. <laughs> this is such a magnetic piece that people almost feel compelled that they want to touch this and change this. So uh, sure enough, this happens while the guard is actually not looking or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, also, um, I think it's a great example of his aesthetic range. I mean, we just saw the most beautiful Zen-like minimal image in the previous. Yes, yes. And here we have almost psychedelic or at least, you know, vibrant abstraction that's created by this magnet, and this is of course, before he had a video camera, he's working with television. Right, uh, right. Well, it was the same year, but also look to the top right and it's a little bit hard to see. Sorry, I think that was my, my cell phone picture from the Whitney a few years ago. Um, you see the, uh, the side being broken up so you could yeah. literally look inside and, and the whole case is really scrappy and, um, looks um, looks like nobody's ever taken care of this poor monitor. Um, and he he so didn't care about that. Um, he didn't care about the the refined and polishedness. You know, it was clearly not the minimalism of Judd, just, you know, I'm sorry, the sort of point to the other extreme. Um, and yet at the same time, this is such an um, such a concern with a beautiful electronic, live form. And this idea of something being alive is clearly 
uh, what uh, what television or what electronics offered to him. Yeah. And I think if we go to the next one, uh, which is in the same room, um, a section we call studio, um, you see um, one of one of our most recent acquisitions, um, TV chair. And, um, and you see him sitting on a version of TV chair that he made for the uh, Kunstverein in Cologne in 76, um, where he was actually, uh, actually sitting on, on top of the image, if you will. And um, so, so if you think about the live image, you see the camera on top um, and you think about what, what a video camera is capturing what kind of reality it is is it um, it is capturing what it what reality is it representing and uh, and how at the same time how you disrupt that system of representation or that system of communication and um, and in this particular case the body of let's say the collector or the performer or the artist in this case um, sits between uh, the camera and the uh, closed circuit um, loop that would have resulted if he was not there, where you would just look at, at the chair and through the chair at the monitor and, and thus you know, just repeat this sort of emptiness in that. So um, who's also, what, if, if, you, if you actually good. fulfill the promise of this piece and sit down, which you cannot do in the museum, um, what do you see? Um, and what do other people see in this? So basically, um, it, it's TV for your bottom kind of thing. Well, it's also very funny. And I think we haven't mentioned, or maybe we did, but we should at least say that there's a lot of humor in the show. Yes, yes. This is certainly one of the most humorous pieces in the whole show. Yeah. Um, but um, so I, I guess that that is an important moment to say yes it is about the disruption of a system it is about the creative use of a system um, but it is also about the the humanizing aspect of technology and that comes through in his humor yes well this is in a it's part of the show that invites participation by the um, gallery viewer this is called three camera participation and it's three closed circuit cameras connected to one of the three colors of the video signal. And so um, it's one of, I said, as I said, a couple of pieces that in which participation is, is offered to the viewer. Um, right. yes. And that's one of the things that he, he really enjoyed and did throughout his, his work. Well, it's, you know, obviously it's, it's humorous, it's playful. Um, it, it does um, um, disassemble technology um, in a fundamental way, but I would also say, you know, why is this contemporary? Well, look at Olaf Eliasson. You know, where would Olaf be without Nam June Paik's groundbreaking work, groundbreaking early work? Um, so the look into to the physics uh, of something um, is is not an end in itself, um, but is but does become a stage for again, for abstraction and, and play with color in this particular case. So I, that's what I find so fast, I continue to find fascinating in Nam June's work that it always goes beyond the technology. And, uh, and while it does work with the fundamentals of the, in this case, um, the electronic uh, color spectrum, um, it is not, ultimately it is not about that. But it is about um, different forms of um, of projecting yourself uh, on a public stage, maybe. Also, obviously, you know, um, here you see um, one of those uh, effects that you could create by actually getting very close to the camera, and um, the um, you know this is coupled with a quote in the back that leads to his satellite projects. And, uh, and the quote is about the fact that um, the business of ninjas is to um, shorten distances be between locations. And he said, for a satellite, that's a piece of cake. So he <laughs> brings into the same context, um, the, the tradition or the legacies of ninjas. And I'm not, necessarily aware of what that actually means. Um, 
with the latest technology and again looks at that from an almost philosophical point of view. So again here the, um, the idea is not necessarily to just represent the body um, in, an, in a one-to-one -one relationship but to actually invite a, um, a play with form and a play with colors. Next uh, we have, uh, this is called um, Zen for Film. And I, as I believe it was a Fluxus event originally. And we should it say- It was, yeah. It was projected, it was projected in, a, in a cinema. And, um, you know, you see, this is the, um, um, the, oh. one, the one moment where uh, we sort of hit the reset button. Uh, we're halfway through the show, and um, for those of you who know our building, um, on the fourth floor we we have uh, we have two equal uh, halves, if you will. Um, so it kind of makes sense to look at um, at the first part and the second part, and we thought let's let's just start again with Cage, uh, because Cage was obviously hugely influential for Nam June. And this piece is a literal response to Cage's seminal four minutes, 33 seconds, which in turn was also a response to Robert Rauschenberg's white paintings. Right, right, which I think we have an image of in the next. Yes, so here you see a clear leader that is projecting um, as close to nothing as you can come um, onto a white screen. And um, you know it's obviously extremely hard to see here on um, you know on a zoom <laughs> on a zoom um, image, um, but of course the um, the projected image is not empty, is not silent. Um, there is always something there, and this something is ultimately the residue of dust and um, yeah. and scratches on the film. So. The, um, the film, as it progresses with each show, gets noisier and noisier, and, um, and ultimately it could, uh, it could become um, a sort of distraction from the idea that there's nothing to see. So um, that is an interesting conceptual point for us, um, thinking about this work from our collection, in what way do we consider something now still the execution of a concept uh, and in what way, for example, does the performativity of a hardware element, in this case, the projector, um, disturb this influence? So th those are interesting conservation discussions, interesting curatorial discussions, but um, I'm also very much looking forward uh, sometime in the future to see um, Zen for Film be exhibited in the same room as uh, Rauschenberg's white painting. Yes. Uh, now we're moving on to um, a couple of uh, pieces, TV Robot for John Cage. This is, and people see these often, these are often exhibited. The, this is a form that, that, that Peg invented. Um, this one is a tribute to John Cage. And um, they're arranged, of course, in each of these TV robots, you have a kind of a, arrangement that suggests a figure. He also did a, another in the same gallery that is dedicated to Merce Cunningham. Um, so he inserted cathode ray tube monitors into vintage radio cabinets that played this manipulated imagery, but also there are objects that relate to the subject in this case. There are piano keys and mushrooms and chess pieces and other things that refer to Cage. Um, so it's another example of his, of his association and admiration for John Cage. And you'll see that in other pieces in the show as well. Right. And um, it's also his family. You know, this is part of a series called The Family of Robots. And um, the whole series is actually based on one of his significant pieces from the 60s, uh, a robot called K456, um, which unfortunately um, could not travel to the US anymore. Um, but um, it was a um, it was one of those um, again scrappy sculptures that, however, would actually move and would do something. And uh, he performed it as part of his Whitney show in the early '80s in New York. 
and took it out of the show, let it have a car accident on, I think, Madison Avenue, uh, and then bring it back into the museum, something <laughs> so impossible. Would that be um, a proposal today um, with almost every museum uh, procedure that you can imagine? But, um, but the idea that a robot um, can do things for you, but can also be uh, a representation of you and can be a um, uh, maybe oblique and humorous take on um, on why we need robots. Um, that is um, that is embodied in in this idea of a family for him. And the family was initially supposed to be, you know, father, mother, baby, grandfather, and so on. But then he extended it to his extended family, uh, specifically, um, obviously, John Cage and Merce Cunningham. And, um, and one of the funny details is um, a little bit hard to see um, that this um, John Cage robot number two has a cutoff tie uh, mm -hmm. around its neck. And, and the tie is this reference to one of his first actions um, in which he cut off, literally cut off Cage's tie as part of his um, musical composition and uh, um, allegedly uh, Cage said he would think twice about attending another pig performance after that. Um, <laughs> and, um, and of course, you know, uh, cutting ties in Germany, uh, in Cologne in particular, is part of carnival, is part of a huge tradition in which women Thursday before carnival uh, walk around the city um, and, and walk the, the floors, the office floors of every office in the city and cut men's ties. Oh, I didn't um, know that. How bizarre. You know, some very strong symbolic gestures <laughs> um, okay. that's, that speak to, you know, how he, um, how much he enjoyed being part of that scene in, in Cologne in those early 60s. Yeah. And of uh, course, you know, as, I'm sorry, as you mentioned, this is, um, this is yet a, another classic peak. Um, the uh, the combination of his fast paced imagery um, with the resurrection of uh, of old technologies, the the wild mix in this, and um, and he continued to do to produce hundreds of sculptures like this, yeah. uh, which we. Uh, that was not a focus of our show because we really wanted to focus on his performative aspects and the music. Um, so this was the ideal um, example um, that would speak to both concerns. Right. And um, as we said, you know, one of one of his most uh, salient characteristics is his. Let's go to the next slide. Is his. Um, he collaborated, he loved to collaborate. And one of his frequent collaborators and, and an artist he really admired was Joseph Boyce. And uh, what we see in the exhibition is their final dual performance called Coyote Three, which of course refers to Boyce's earlier Coyote, I Like America, America Likes Me, in which he performed with a live coyote. Um, so here there's big projection and you see Cage uh, playing Chopin and other, you know, he was a really good, pianist and he really knew and understood Western music. And music is always part of his work. But there's a second piano which isn't played at all. Instead, voice is, you know, sort of typically sort of saying, you know, in unpronounceable or un, you know, random words and guttural sounds. And um, I think it's interesting that he he so admired Joseph Boyce, even though Boyce was older, they shared a lot of uh, a lot of characteristics and interests. But I think that one of the big differences is that um, in, in uh, Cage's, I mean, excuse me, in Boyce's case, he was so much about his, his self, his own persona, whereas that's not really the case as far as I can see um, for Paik. Um, anyway, it's right. a, it's, it's yeah, a terrific this... situation because it, 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 you have an entire gallery for this, this performance. Right, right. And um, this, is, this is one way of saying, um, this is something to really look at more closely. And it's not just another document of a performance um, or a collaboration. This is actually a concert. This is a one hour concert, which happened in Tokyo. And um, 
supposedly they they met on the plane from Germany to Tokyo. They both happened to have a solo show in Tokyo at the same time. And they said, because they had performed together um, in the 70s in Dusseldorf um, in a piano concert, why not do this again? And it was um, almost unscripted. All they knew was they they were going to have two pianos on it. And certainly Paik wasn't informed on on what Boyce was planning to do. You see one of his um, iconic uh, blackboards um, and he would scribble on those. You see the title there. Um, he would uh, scribble a kind of Morse code. He would occasionally um, speak a few words in German to a Japanese audience. And he would basically just um, pronounce a few um, sort of Rudolf Steiner in inspired um, romantic um, words that um, that were then coupled with uh, names of composers um, like Beethoven, um, Chopin and others and um, and he would he would associate them with meat. Uh, Beethoven became pork um, and uh, and other than that he would just growl and make those uh, unintelligible, noises into the microphone uh, while Peck was accompanying him uh, with classical music, with songs, mm -hmm. um, romantic songs as well. And, um, and at the end, there's a, a beautiful moment where, where Peck is sort of hammering on, on the piano and Boyce joins him and almost embraces him. And, um, and clearly Namjoon was kind of embarrassed uh, with this on stage. Um, but it's such a beautiful expression of the link and the bond between the two of them. Um, and to, um, to those who, who um, know more or who like to know more about boys, there's a whole history of him um, sp uh, addressing sort of this, um, let's say, um, repressed, um, what, what Pig would probably call shamanistic, um, mm -hmm. side of boys that was based on his mythology of being shut down as an um, as a war pilot um, somewhere deep in Russia or Siberia and uh, how he would be you know rescued by the Tatars and uh, and of course that spoke to Namjoon so much who associated himself so so intimately and profoundly with the um, the nomadic culture of Mongolia and um, and of course they shared, you know, a really broken post-war political history with the two countries, Korea and Germany, being divided for so long. Um, so yeah. it's 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 one of those moments where we try to really highlight something that is rarely seen and certainly has never found that kind of um, resonance in in Peck's, uh, Peck's shows. You know, I think we have to move along a little more quickly. Yes, we yes, let's move on. Yes. To talk about this, of course, no Pake retrospective would be complete without a presentation of TV Garden, which was first made in 1974. So this has a whole gallery to itself. In this dimly lit space, you see all 40, I think it's 49 televisions embedded with uh, potted plants. And you're seeing Global Groove, which was created with John Godfrey in 73, which includes imagery from commercial television, avant-garde performance, Allen Ginsberg, classical music, and so on and so on. So it's, it's a very exciting um, piece. And uh, it's an interesting demonstration of how he, he equated nature and electronics and also how he dealt with space. Yes. Also, there's one monitor in here. These are, which is different from all the others. Is that true? Uh, sorry, say again. One monitor that's larger than the others. Uh, no, there's one sort of hidden in the middle hidden, that yeah. doesn't have the correct aspect ratio. You know, oh, everything right, is right. four by three as it should, and then there's one that just doesn't conform to that rule. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was I was pointing this out and said, you know, why are we using this? Uh, you know, we shouldn't, uh, as the contentious um, curator of media arts. <laughs> and um, and John Hoffman, you know, his assistant said, well, Namjoon would have loved it. Why not? You know, yes. let this one be the odd one, and um, and still he would have loved the image. 
So um, yeah, so nothing should be 100% perfect. Nothing should be too perfect, you know, another quote by him. Yeah. And um, what we really loved about this piece is that it is one of those moments that uh, offer you a really immersive environment that works on you almost physically, certainly mentally. It's, it brings you into a different mood. Um, while you are listening to Cage or to Ginsberg or others. And, um, and it provides this, this break in the show, um, this moment of rest, of slowing down, um, while ironically, the video is at times really fast paced and upbeat. And, you know. So it's, it's these uh, almost um, juxtapositions or um, this confluence of different things going on at the same time. Yes. And, um, and yes, again, one, one other example of, of Peg's program to not perform music, but to expose music, to work with space and to let the people uh, wander in that space. And then um, moving right along, um, we have an example of one of his three satellite broadcasts. This one is called yes. Mr. What? Orwell. Um, so it's a rebuttal to Orwell's 1984, and it brings together events happening at the same time in US and Europe, mixing. And typically it's high art, low art. You've got Philip Glass, Merce Cunningham, Peter Gabriel, Allen Ginsberg and so on. And, and this is one of three, as I said, that uh, satellite broadcast that he did another one called Bye Bye Kipling, right. which links New York, Seoul, and Tokyo. Well, and it's, think, go to ahead. me, this is one of the big surprises. And I, um, you know, one of, one of the um, intentions, obviously, of doing a retrospective is to, to just check in and see, you know, how does that resonate with the public today? Is this still relevant today? Or is this history now? Is it antiquated, maybe? Or is it dated, etc.? cetera? And, uh, and video works from the 80s can quickly seem dated today um, in, in that they rely very much on whatever kind of editing or, or image processing software was available um, then and brand new. Um, but, uh, but this one is, uh, I wanna say almost by far the most popular room in the show, very much to my surprise. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems to speak to a whole new generation, which is really wonderful to see that, um, that almost the eyes of our public today are different. They look at this with a different, um, maybe a different mindset, but also obviously because we have, we have changed so much. Uh, we have grown accustomed to so much um, that they can see also the, the fun in this. And, um, you know, we chose this one still in particular because I could only say, who on earth would put Merce Cunningham and Dali and Mao into the same frame? This is just <laughs> insane. <laughs> Um, and, and then again, you know, why not? Um, all of this is present at the same time. Um, right. It was very often read as a positive rebuttal to Orwell. You know, this was aired on January 1st, 1984 and coming straight out of the gate, you know, and basically showing the public, look, 1984 is not what, you, your, what your fears are all about. Um, and of course, um, we know better today that a lot of fears were actually justified in terms of surveillance, etc. cetera. Um, but he was able to also really, really think about space as an electronic space and a space of communication and to link uh, these distant uh, remote locations um, through this kind of uh, mix of avant-garde and pop uh, was just unheard of um, and is still groundbreaking today. Yeah. Now we're coming to, um, in some ways, you could call it a culmination. Um, this is a piece that was first shown in the German pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 1993 called Sistine Chapel. And if I'm correct, um, isn't this where you met Paik? Yes, well, um, in person for the first time, that's yeah. true. And um, at the time I was actually a, um, a on the side, um, to making some money as a journalist for German television. Uh, so I was interviewing Peck for this, and um, I was I was struck by by this piece, um, as were many people at the time. Um, this one, this uh, I mean, he was 
you know, he was paired with Hans Hake in the German pavilion, and the pavilion won the Golden Lion uh, in that year. Uh, it was also a very strong political message by a reunified German uh, Germany, uh, and the commissioner Klaus Busmann said, "Let's uh, let's take let's get out of this East uh, East West German thing, and let's let's look." at a global scale and let's take two who have strong ties to Germany, but are actually living abroad. Um, both artists came from New York for this. And, um, but at the same time, you would also see people were just stunned, uh, sometimes amazed, but also shocked. And, uh, and the sheer amount of hardware and software everywhere around you uh, was not easy to digest for a lot of people. And certainly throughout the 90s, the, the battle between what art and technology uh, could mean was still raging. And uh, a lot of people dismissed video, as we all know, um, for so long uh, that this was, um, I think it was considered a breakthrough in many ways. And um, as we were starting our curatorial discussion around what to do, I, I suggested that we should revisit the possibility of restaging it. And, uh, and showing it literally for the first time outside of Venice, because let's admit, who, who had the pleasure and, and the, the luxury of traveling to Venice um, and would remember this? Certainly it's nothing that could easily travel or easily be staged, except within the concept or the context of such a large uh, show. And um, we worked very closely with the estate. I think we have one image on that let's go to coming the next up. One. Um, yes, so here you see sort of our process of mapping um, projections onto the space and you see very clearly that this is about immersive environments and in the context of our um, commodified commercial um, industry of spectacles working with immersive environments today, this is sort of the antithesis, this is the I always say this is the real Sistine Chapel. This is the, the Sistine Chapel that is adequate for our media society where images get distributed in, in, in so many ways, but they do not ever form a perfect simulation. They are mixed, they are blurry, they inter, um, interlace and they interact with each other. Um, they certainly occupy the space, not in a, in a straightforward, um, you know, architectural mapping kind of way. Um, they are also, last but not least, they are also completely randomly mixed. So let's so, look the next, next, next slide. Yeah. It shows yeah, the, here we see that. Right. Yeah. Um, so the way that we reconstructed that was to look at old photographs and, and see the way that um, projectors would occupy walls and the ceiling and to um, approach that sense of, um, of spatialization of four channels um, that all depend on a small or two small video mixing um, modules that were designed by the ever-present Japanese engineer Shuya Abe and, uh, and randomly um, choose content for each projector. We have about 40 here, um, if I'm not mistaken, something like 43 or so. Um, so you never walk into the same space. Um, yeah. In any case, it's raw. You know, it, it's not a space of contemplation only, despite the fact that there are moments of silence in it. You know, but I found that, that people are mesmerized by this. I mean, it, it's, it's assaultive on one hand, and you know, typically you have yes. a, a mix of imagery of, uh, from Pake's own work to David Bowie to Janis Joplin and so forth, but people are just kind of mesmerized by it and sit in this space and really- They, they also recognize what they have just walked through. They yeah. meet people again. So they literally see the way that Namjoon would constantly remix his own work yeah. to the point where Boyce was getting annoyed even, like, stop yeah. using me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, so after this, this environment, which is immersive, and um, we come to the, to the end of the show and the final work is, is just as sublime as the Sistine Chapel is not. Uh, called One Candle Candle Projection, 
and you have a closed circuit camera pointing at a flickering flame. So of course, again, references to Catholicism, to Buddhism, meditative practice, and so on. So it's really a wonderful coming around at the end to some of the basic um, attitudes of, of his work and, and Zen and so forth. And note, uh, note the year here, 1989, and it directly contradicts Peck's own saying that you know he was uh, he was tired of his minimalism. Um, he would go back to this again and again throughout his life. Yes. And of course, you see again three camera participation. You see the one candle TV. Um, you see the um, sort of um, you know as as a formally raised Catholic, I can say. Uh, well, of course, the side chapel is is almost as important as the main um, nave of, of the church. Um, but it is a um, one last little detail which made it so fascinating for us to install this and to think about this piece is um, the, the, the basic assumption here is that the, the flame of the candle needs to be in the center of the lens of the camera. And of course, as we all know, candles burn down. So over time, the center is not, uh, does not hold. And it, it requires one of our staff members to adjust the flame or the candle once every hour. Uh -huh. This is the kind of love and care we give to the work. Yes. Well, um, you know, Peck is also credited with using the term electronic superhighways. He actually recognized the potential of interconnectivity electronically. Um, and for him, it was kind of like, wasn't it sort of a utopian idea, the idea of connecting, connecting everyone in the world. But then, of course, he didn't live long enough to see the, the adverse side of all of this. But um, in conclusion, Rudolf, um, what would you what would you say that people should should feel about this show as they leave it? I mean, what what is the real message of this show? Well, um, I, I'm, I'm sure there's not just one message. I hope there's not just one message. No, uh, but not. certainly, I think what it did for me, or for me and my colleague Sue at the Tate, is it uh, it shows takes um, continued relevance today. Um, and I would say um, he still feels quite contemporary in that yeah. regard. And, um, and I think apart from the narrative around him being the pioneer of, uh, of video and, um, and communication um, and uh, electronics and whatnot, um, I think what we have successfully managed to show and to stage is um, the way that he bridged the gaps between music and fine arts, um, between performance and, uh, and sculpture, and, um, and certainly between video and everything else. And that is, um, that seems to resonate with a public today that is fundamentally changed. And, um, I give you um, as a father of a 24 year old daughter who's one of her friends, you know, same age, said that he felt the show um, was um, expletive sick. <laughs> um, it, it was, he called it sick, yeah. which, um, you know, I, I could say maybe fucking sick, um, but you can, ex you know, delete that. <laughs> It's, uh, it, is, it is one of the compliments of a young generation that actually engaged with the work be, being so, um, so much based on images everywhere, on, on yeah. technologies being everywhere with us all the time, yeah. that to encounter this work in space and in real time is, um, is just a really unique experience. And, yeah. um, and that said, uh, you know, obviously uh, we live in the Bay Area, which is a hugely mixed um, uh, center of, uh, of all kinds of cultures. And, um, and we see that mix really represented in our galleries much more than, you know, you would say, you know, even Bruce Conner show I did, or, you know, Rauschenberg or others. 
uh, this speaks to a lot more people today. We also, I think we should um, close with um, letting people know that there's going to be a special event in September, September 17. Thanks for mentioning uh, it. We are, we, are go we are going to perform the world premiere of Do It Yourself, where two pianists play Bach. The left hand is going to be played in San Francisco in our museum, and the right hand is going to be played in Shanghai. Okay. And uh, so stay tuned for this major performative event engaging uh, up to 20 contemporary artists performing in homage to Paig or in reference to Paig, to his writing, but also to his work. That's great. That will be, be streamed be online. <laughs> okay, now I guess we're allowing people to ask questions. Who is going to, who's going to repeat the questions? Yeah, we'll, we'll jump right to right to Q&A. Uh, thank you, Rudolph and Connie, for that conversation. And I, as, as part of this, this younger generation, I suppose, I would like to second that I do think that this show looks fucking sick. Um, and <laughs> it looks amazing. And I, I was really loving hearing the connection between, uh, you know, we're looking at, we have a Zoom background here of the TV Buddha and, you know, hearing how this works. I love that. Yeah. Emojis. yeah, it's really, it's, it's been really interesting to hear about, uh, you guys talk about this work. Um, we're going to go first to a question from G.E. Schwartz. G.E., you should be able Hi, to. Hi, thank you. Um, can we say that the emotion of his art is impersonal? Are you speaking of personal experience? Not mine, no, <laughs> of course not. But no, I guess his, in other words, um, was he was he making art, I guess we could say more for the universal or was it more, it wasn't, or was it um, uh, diaristic, um, you know, um, personal work of his own that he was, he was putting or was he doing a combination of both even? I guess we could even say that or ask. Well, I guess one of the things we didn't point out so well is, um, is something that you see clearly with most of his sculptures. There's not, there's not a single surface that he doesn't touch, that he doesn't comment on, that he doesn't draw on. So he gives each piece his sort of own personal mark. And, and he continues this uh, also through drawing. He, he's, he's done painting um, assemblages and et cetera. Um, so there's nothing in which you would not see either um, his visual grammar, um, say emoticons today, mm -hmm. you know, he had his own visual grammar uh, around Buddhas, TVs, etc. Uh, but you would also see characters, you know, in, um, in, in Korean, Japanese, um, other right, you know, other languages, as we pointed out. So I would say he made almost everything quite personal, um, but he would also say, you know, I'm, um, he, he called it a, a merchant of delicatessen. You know, he, he saw himself as the fine cost handler um, in that text where he said, you know, I'm, I'm just preparing a, a space for things to happen for other people to also shine. I hope that answers your question. So yes, I would it say does. it's it's, it's very cool. much personal, but always um, with an eye on uh, on other people, uh, other collaborators, uh, and the audience. Thank you so very much. Thank you, GE, for that question. Um, we are now going to go to Helen Colton, who had two really great questions in the chat. Helen, I'm asking you to unmute now. You should see a little pop-up right in the middle of the screen that will, there you go. Love it, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for taking my question. Um, there were lots of questions that came up um, during the presentation. The first one was a curiosity about philosophical influences. You touched on um, Zen, but I'm wondering if there were Western philosophical thinkers that um, factored into his practice. And I'm also interested in, um, this intersection between music and architecture, and if Paik 
actually referred to his own practice as making architecture with and from sound. Um, yes to the first question. Um, he was wild, uh, widely read, um, very informed. Um, he would constantly process, um, let's say, the event of the days, but also, um, look, almost in the first place, he came to the West to actually study Western culture. And he was certainly aware of, uh, of that music history and the philosophy attached to that. Um, he made references to uh, Plato and Aristotle, Nietzsche and others. Um, I cannot speak to, um, I, I, I would not be able to identify one philosopher he was um, deeply shaped by or, or influenced by. But, um, but I would say that um, he was arguably one of the first to actually bring in cultural and philosophical um, legacies from both West and the East into one context, into one practice. And, uh, and of course, again, we're, we're struck by the fact that for, for most of us, we only know a portion of that. We only have maybe one particular set of references that we know about or that we care about. Um, so, uh, so the depth and the layering of those references is not immediately accessible to all of us in, in its depth, but it was. And he wrote, um, he wrote ex extensively about that. So um, maybe um, in, in its most, um, if I dare to, to, to sort of formulate one thesis, it would be to say that he definitely um, tried to overcome any kind of dialectical system or thinking in his practice. And what was the second, there was a second question. Yeah, sorry, um, uh, the architecture. Yeah. Um, well, um, you know, apart from the basic level that he would literally, if, if he could, when he, whenever he could, he would um, take over an entire space. Um, in the process of installing the show, um, we discussed on and on sound levels in the galleries. And, um, and John, John Hoffman would constantly say, well, you know, Namjoon would, would make it even louder. Yeah. He, he, would, he would try to be even more present, even more in your face um, with, um, with his sounds and his works. And, um, and what I hope to show through the Sistine Chapel was that um, he, he did engage very creatively with space and he would not consider the boundary of a wall and a ceiling as sort of two distinct features, uh, but it was all one for him. And, um, and to, some, to some extent, I think um, the, we have a large uh, enlarged photograph from his first show in Wuppertal and you know, keep in mind that was a very bourgeois villa by um, a renowned um, architect who was living there, and um, and he would take over the entire space, and you could say he would mess it up. Um, mm -hmm. He would that was as close as he ever got to uh, to really fulfilling the program of Symphony for Twenty Rooms, right. um, basically leading you everywhere from the basement and the bathrooms to the hallways and the living room and bedrooms, etc. Um, I think he was probably forbidden to, to use literally every room. They also needed to live somewhere, but um, it was, uh, that was programmatic, you know, and um, I unfortunately did not see uh, in person the marvelous uh, retrospective that the Guggenheim did in 2000, but um, he, would, um, he would throw pictures everywhere as he did in the Sistine Chapel. So <clears throat> I think um, there is one unrealized project um, at SF MoMA, which um, which explained a little bit the lack of major works by the artist um, in our collection in previous years, and um, and that was to um, to basically occupy the ceiling of our new building, um, opened then by Mario Botta in 1995, and it was just bad timing. You know, they that that just yeah. didn't take off because they just couldn't raise the funds for it at the time. Are there other questions? Thank you. 
Thank you so much for asking, Helen. That was lovely. Um, sorry to cut you off. Uh, we are now going to move to a question from David Roth. David, you should be able to click that and unmute. Uh, I think the question that I was asking um, concerns the story about Joseph Boyce being shot down and being uh, revived by uh, tribesmen and enclosed in this, uh, the, the whole story of the airplane crash. I had read somewhere recently where that story was proven to be untrue. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. I, well, this is slightly off topic. <laughs> But I would say, um, I don't know, you know, it's, um, it, it may, you know, it, it's a fact that he was shut down. Um, the, um, the salvation um, may, may be embellished, or maybe sort of told, maybe told in a, in a certain way that resonated with Boyce's own philosophy. Um, in any case, it's a story that um, and a spirit that connected boys very closely to Peck and vice versa. So I think it, it worked, it had its productive effects um, and it was maybe less important whether it was true in every detail or not. Right, that's how I understand it. Thank you. Great, and then we have one more audience question. Uh, I'm going to go to Bridget, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I'm gonna pass you the mic um, in just a moment. You should be able to unmute. Yeah, I, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it just a general yeah. problem. If you are watching from two devices, you might want to mute one of them and then we'll be able to hear you more clearly. Okay, sorry. I, I, you could have just read my. You could have just. You could have just read my question. I ju just want to know if this retrospective will be shown in New York. So forgive me for all this technical no. mess. No. no, it will not. Um, as I said earlier, um, this uh, was meant to be a touring show that would go to places where. Um, Nam Jun had never been seen in a, in a you know, major way. And of course, he's had important shows throughout his life in New York. So this was going to be the one show that would not travel to New York. So you have to come. It, it was, was at the Whitney at to, some to point. To be fair, yeah. it, was, it was supposed to travel to Chicago, to the MCA, but um, that touring venue had to cancel because of the pandemic. Yeah, but because of his uh, demise, it would be good to make it travel anyway. Well, um, look, this is always the conundrum that we face. It would be great to, to let the show travel everywhere, but um, it, it costs money. Yeah. Well, it costs money, but also it can't because a lot of the, loans. a lot of the loans just cannot even survive two venues. You know, we had to reconstitute parts of the show um, for almost every, uh, every location. And oh. the fragility of objects and, uh, and the loan process is just um, not conducive to a, a, longer, a longer tour, I'm afraid. Yeah, thank you, I understand. And thank you for this beautiful presentation because that gives us a little tour from a, sure. from a bar. So I really appreciate personally. Thank you. That was also a nice uh, acoustic intervention. Yes, very, very <laughs> take in. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, thank you. No, that's all right. Thank you very much. All right, and now we're going to move to our head of our ship, Fong Bui. Hey, Fong. Hi, Connie. Hey, Fong. <laughs> thank you so much, Rudolph. This is terrific conversation. I enjoy it immensely. So it just, it brings back so much memory. Um, I did manage to meet Nam Jung and also with Sigeko yeah. uh, in 2004. I think it was September. We have a terrific time and I did manage to interview 
Sigeko for the rail. At the same time, he was failing in his illness, so I didn't manage doing the, one of the great regrets of the rail, really. But my question was that, you know, there was tremendous tension uh, between matureness in relationship to Nick Higgins. You probably know this, Rudolph, and I'm sure yes. other friends know it too. But the fact that Higgins undertook an academic approach and tried to analyze what Fluxus was, and which point basically he was kicked out of the Fluxus <laughs> circle by Matunas. Matunas, yes. I'm paraphrasing it because it was told to me by Jonas Makers, where Jonas said that we are playfully to become serious, not seriously to become serious. Something of that account. Uh, but my question, the other, which is, would lead to the another, you know, humor, which when Nam Jung was invited to the White House along with other distinguished <laughs> Korean, uh, to 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 greet, I think the the South Korean president, they uh, they Jung Kim, and I know that it was sometime in June ninety eight. So that's already in previous January where the controversy of Monica Lewinsky happened at the White House. So that's a previous few months prior. I was told, I mean, you can correct me, I'm wrong, Rudolph, but Jonas told me the whole episode that when he, it's time for him to stand up because he's bound, chair bounded for so long. So when he stood up to shake Clinton's hand, his pants fell down. I've heard this too. Yeah, can you confirm whether that's a deliberate act or accidental? <laughs> Look, um, um, I, I wasn't around. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if that was deliberate or not. Um, I would almost say um, I, I would prefer it to not be deliberate, but to just be a happy accident. Okay. <laughs> And, yeah. uh, and again, it's the same, same answer to the previous question about boys, you know, is it true? What, was he really intent on doing that? Um, he, was, um, he was so loose in his manners um, that, um, and, he, and he was um, quite um, anti-authoritarian in many ways. So you could easily imagine this being a deliberate gesture, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, but also, um, Again, I'm, you know, I've, I've never seen actual proof of that. Um, he, you know, he had a stroke in 96 and yeah. he was in a wheelchair for most of his last 10 years. And so he, maybe he had to get up and it was, it was a malfunctioning of wardrobe uh, as well. Um, I don't know, but it, isn't it a beautiful story? So, um, oh, yeah, Absolutely. Exactly. so I think, um, the irreverence um, and um, and you know he was he was coming out of a rich family you know it was not that he did not have money um, mm -hmm. he was he was one of the um, back in in Germany in the late fifties he was the first to have I think a four track um, recorder uh, audio recorder um, and mm. uh, and still you know he was. Um, he, he was also messy in other ways. And, uh, and I think that was, that just defined his personality. So I'm, um, I, yeah, tell the story as a story. I, that would be my recommendation. <laughs> but thanks for, for hosting us, Fong Gui. Um, no, this is great. Much Terrific. appreciated. Yes, it will be put on YouTube for um, it's second life, and so everyone can come to hear this uh, important conversation, Rudolph. So for that, we are grateful to you and grateful to our beloved Connie, as usual, and uh, and everyone who tuned out here for our lunchtime conversation. It's hard to believe, but it's three hundred thirty-nine. Am I right? Really? But, uh, yeah, it's maybe booked till the end of the year. <laughs> Woo, you you, you do much better than we do. Congratulations. Thank I you so much. Commend, I have to commend you, Fung and, and the rail, and you know, always doing such a great job. I don't even know how you do it. But uh, thank you for that. 
Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Rudolph. Back to you, Ty. <laughs> Thank you, Fong. Uh, and now at the rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today we are continuing and reinventing that tradition with a performance. I am thrilled to welcome our poet, artist, musician, laureate of the day, Clara Joy to the stage. Artist and musician Clara Joy released her first album at 15, earning a fast growing indie reputation. Her latest single, We're Not All In This Together, recently went viral on TikTok in support of streaming the song to help donate to trans youth. Check the chat for Clara's full bio. On to you, Clara. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be on the same event as Paik and um, I'm super grateful to be here. So I'm going to be performing a song called Body on the Sidewalk. Um, yeah. <laughs> Body on the sidewalk We don't make eye contact I don't think he's breathing I'm back to sitting on the streets again And I don't know why Walking by myself in the window, the same window each time I've been here before. Verse is a void from which no light can escape, and they're picking up bodies from the sidewalk, and they're picking up bodies from the sidewalk. Mechanical love. Give someone a swipe. It's late at night, and they want to go home. Body on the side. sitting on the streets again and I don't know why. Cool. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Clara. And thank you, Connie and Rudolph again for this lovely conversation. And thank you all who tuned in today and for your questions. Uh, join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation between Senga Nengudi, Amanda Sroka, and Rail Editor-at-Large, Jason Rosenfeld. We'll conclude with a poetry reading as always. And you can now turn on your microphones and say goodbye as you leave. Say hello to Amanda for me. <laughs> I will. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So Thanks, Connie. Thanks, Rudolph. Thanks, Thank Clara. You. Thank you so much. What could be better? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rudolph. Bye. Thank you Bye, so everybody. much. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye. Thank you for being here for a moment also. Thank you. Bye. That was really great. It was Thank great. you, Connie. Thank you, Rudolph. Thank you, Clara. Thank you, Clara, for the beautiful Clara. performance also. Thank you. Beautiful. Can't wait to see the show. Yes, you must. It's still on view fly. until October 3. Yes. Great. Ah. Can't wait to fly there and have dinner with you also. Hello. Yeah.
Right. Excited. Just get in touch, please. I will. We will. Thank you. Thank you, Rudolph.